today, as I'm sure you already know. I'm talking about the animal liberation movement. I'll give you some background as to what the attitudes to animals have been like in the past, focusing particularly on the traditions that have been important in the West. Then I'll talk about uh, the philosophy of animal liberation and uh, where we are today. And I'll conclude with some brief thoughts about where we may hope to be in the future. So let's um, go back to the beginnings of Western thought, which comes really out of two different traditions. Um, obviously, one of the traditions is the Hebrew tradition, the book of Genesis. And as I'm sure we all are aware, the book of Genesis explicitly states that God gives man dominion over the animals. Now, we might think today that we are not likely to take that very literally, but it has certainly been influential in the past when we look at justifications for uh, not giving weight to the interests of animals. So this is the, this is the, the first uh, one of these roots which leads into the idea that we are entitled to, justified, to use animals as things to meet our needs or our interests, um, including, of course, most centrally for food. And here's the other major root of Western thinking coming out of the philosophy of ancient Greece. And although there were different philosophical uh, lines of thought in ancient Greece, there was a Platonic view and even a Pythagorean view, which seems to have been more sympathetic to animals and to vegetarianism. <clears throat> but perhaps unfortunately for the animals, the view that became most influential in the Western tradition was that of Aristotle. And Aristotle's view of the universe was one of a kind of a hierarchy in which the less rational served the more rational, as you can see from uh, this. So Aristotle thought that plants exist for the sake of animals, and animals exist, the brute beasts, he calls them, for the sake of man. And this is justified in terms of higher levels of rationality going on here. <coughs> Aristotle notoriously applied this also to the differences between uh, Greeks and non-Greeks, those whom he referred to as barbarians. And because he thought Greeks were more rational than the barbarians, he also justified slavery. Um, because the less rational, again, served the more rational, so it's legitimate for the Greeks to enslave the barbarians. We have, <coughs> excuse me, we have fortunately many years ago uh, rejected that view, but as far as Aristotle's views of animals are concerned, they have not really been rejected, or not completely. So Aristotle's views came into Christian thought through the work of Thomas Aquinas, who um, was the most significant of the medieval Christian thinkers, so-called scholastics. And um, he was familiar with Aristotle because uh, Aristotle's work had come down to him through, uh, through being preserved in uh, Arabic philosophy and uh, therefore came down to Aquinas who simply referred to Aristotle as the philosopher. He didn't really know other comparable philosophers. Um, but Aquinas quite explicitly combines the Aristotelian view with the Hebrew view and the early Christian view. And so, um, in this particular quote, he is really referring to the verse from Genesis that I gave you earlier. 
He says God has subjected all things to man's power. But look how strong the implications are that he draws from that. He says it doesn't matter how we behave to animals. And elsewhere he elaborates on this to say there is no sin, no sin in being cruel to animals. Well, there's no sin really in anything that we do as far as it directly concerns animals. Because, partly because of God's dominion, partly because of the Aristotelian justification that they exist to serve us, and also, he says, because they don't have immortal souls. So that's also seen as a reason for thinking that it doesn't matter what we do to animals. Um, so... Uh, the only, the only thing that Aquinas ever says to somewhat soften this view is that perhaps if we're cruel to animals, we will become cruel to humans as well. In other words, we'll develop a cruel nature and we'll be worse to humans. And if so, then that would be bad. But it would only be bad because it's bad for humans. Again, the, the animals don't really matter. The fact that we're causing animals to suffer doesn't matter in itself. Now, unfortunately, this view became dominant for many centuries in the Western tradition because Aquinas was the single most important philosopher in Roman Catholic thought. So that uh, the philosophy that he developed, which was known as Thomism, um, became a sort of semi-official philosophy of the Roman Catholic Church and right up into the 19th century, uh, you could see this view propounded by Catholic thinkers in saying why we shouldn't really be concerned about cruelty to animals. Uh, it's not really important in itself. So I think this was a strong negative influence on the early movements to um, extend concern to animals. Um, and countries that were more under the influence of the Roman Catholic Church tended to be slower to develop more enlightened attitudes to animals than countries that were not influenced by the Roman Catholic Church. And I'll leave you to reflect on whether that has affected Spain and its attitudes to animals. Um, but also among Protestants, you can certainly find um, quite negative attitudes to animals. Here's Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher of the late 18th century, one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, undoubtedly, but in terms of his attitude to animals, I think not at all a careful or clear thinker. Um, because he says, like Aquinas, though not for exactly the same reason, but like Aquinas, he says, we have no direct duties to animals. So, again, the only reason for not being cruel to them would be if, therefore, it indirectly leads us to, um, to treat humans badly. Animals are not self-conscious. That's his reason. And, therefore, and are there merely as a means to an end, and that end is man. He doesn't explain why a being that is not self-conscious could not be an end in itself. Why the fact that it does not feel pain is not an end in itself. And I think it would have been really quite consistent with some of Kant's views if he'd accepted that. The leading American Kantian philosopher in ethics, Christine Korsgaard, who's a professor at Harvard University, does take a different view from Kant on this point. She thinks animals are ends in themselves, even though they're not self-conscious, because they can feel pain or they can enjoy their life, and that's enough to make them an end in themselves. But around the same time that Kant was writing, or just a little bit later, we can find in England a different line of thought developing. And here's the man who first states it clearly, Jeremy Bentham, the founding father of the English utilitarian school, um, who wrote in this work the uh, introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, um, which he published uh, which he wrote shortly after the French Revolution. So, although he doesn't discuss animals at any length in this work, he does have a very significant footnote. 
And the footnote says, um, the French revolutionaries have discovered that the color of a man's skin is no justification for making him a slave. Because the French revolutionaries, of course, ended slavery in the French colonies. Um, so Bentham refers to this. And then he makes a very interesting remark. He says, one day it may come to be recognized that other anatomical features, and Bentham here lists some of the features that separate humans from non-human animals, that they are also no justification for abandoning a sensitive being to the caprice of a tormentor. So he's saying, just as the color of a man's skin is not a reason for making him a slave, so the fact that a being has four legs or fur or something like that is not a reason for saying, well, you know, it doesn't matter if you torture them or make them suffer in some way. So Bentham is looking forward to, he's writing at a time when there is no legislation in England nor anywhere else in Europe to protect animals from cruelty. And he's looking forward to a time when that might happen. And he considers, this is quite a long footnote, obviously, as you can see, he considers the objection, I suppose perhaps thinking of Kant, that somebody might say, well, they can't reason, or they can't talk. And he says, that's true, but it's also true of babies, for example. Human babies cannot reason, nor can they talk. And then he says, in any case, that's not really the question. And this is where this quote comes in. The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So Bentham, I think, is the first to put this so clearly that uh, it's the suffering that really matters, not the capacity to reason or to use language, and also, very interestingly, to draw this comparison with racism and the racism that led to slavery. So Bentham wrote that, but I wouldn't say that a great deal of notice was taken of it, but gradually over the next two decades, the first laws to prevent cruelty to animals were introduced into the British Parliament and uh, eventually were passed. And the change of attitude that then developed, I think, was also influenced by this man, Charles Darwin. This is a quote which he did not publish at this time. This is, I show a picture of him here as a young man because this was written when he was quite a young man um, in 1837 to 8. But he did not publish this during his lifetime. Perhaps certainly at that time he thought it was too daring an idea to put before the public. Um, but he's saying here, well, we arrogantly think of ourselves as so great that we could only have been created by God worthy of the interposition of a deity. But, uh, Darwin says here, it's more humble but truer to consider him created from animals. So the idea that we have developed from animals, that animals are our ancestors, that we in fact are animals in a sense, comes with this insight from Darwin, which he really only published um, more than 30 years later in The Descent of Man. Um, in, published in 1871. So those ideas took a while to soak in, but I think they have certainly made a difference in the long run. And when Darwin did publish The Descent of Man in 1871, his argument for the fact that we have descended from animals was not based only on similarities in our anatomy, like looking at our bones or our organs and showing how they are similar to those in uh, other apes and how they are similar to those in other monkeys and so on and so forth. But he also looked at our psychological characteristics and those of animals. And so you find this very interesting passage in The Descent of Man where Darwin is saying that not only are there physical parallels between our bodies and the bodies of animals, but there is also psychological continuity that we see in animals forms of the same ways of behaving and the same emotions that we see in our own children. 
and he compares the happiness exhibited by puppies and kittens and lambs when they're playing together with the happiness we see in our own children when they're playing together. And also, of course, he says they manifestly feel pain and misery as well as pleasure and happiness. So Darwin was pretty clear that animals can feel pain and that also, I think, contributed to the idea that they are morally significant in themselves. Okay, so those are the, that's the background from which the present animal liberation move, movement emerged. And it builds on, particularly, I think, Bentham's insights, but also, of course, Darwin's. But so far, we've not really come a huge distance from the earlier view. We have certainly moved. I think generally people, if you say, well, what do most people believe today? And this would be true in Europe, this would be true in the United States, would be true in many other countries. I think you could say, well, most people think that we ought not to be cruel to animals. Simple wanton cruelty is something we reject. So if you go out in the street and you see that, uh, let's say, somebody is hitting a dog with a heavy stick, you will probably be shocked by that. And you might try and stop them. Or if the person is too strong, you might call the police and get the police to stop them. So we, we generally accept that we ought not to be cruel to animals. But on the other hand, where our own interests are involved, where, for example, our interests in getting food cheaply are involved, then we tend not to give weight to the interests of animals. So certainly not the same weight that we give to the interests of humans, even where the interests are similar. So I think this view has some problems, problems both of coherence and problems of how it would be defended. And I'm suggesting this as an alternative view, that animals have interests. I say here vertebrates at least. I'll come back to this topic in a moment of which animals have interests. They have interests because, as Darwin said, they can feel pain or misery. Or on the other hand, they can feel pleasure or happiness. So if a being can be miserable or it can be happy, then it has an interest in being happy. So I think that's, if you agree with that, that's enough to give it an interest. And I would suggest that along the lines that Bentham was talking about, that the differences between the species are not sufficient to say that we should give less weight to similar interests of animals just because they're not members of our species. Species membership is not relevant any more than race is relevant in deciding, for instance, who should be a slave and who should not be, or if we don't think anybody should be slaves, I hope we don't, um, also not thinking about how much weight we should give to someone's interests, where their interests are at stake. So the view that I have argued for is this principle, the principle of equal consideration of interests, which requires us to give equal weight to similar interests. Right? It's not saying that all interests are alike, irrespective of species, but it is saying where interests are similar, we should give equal weight irrespective of species. And I'll come to this point in a moment about similar interests. OK, so on that grounds, I reject what I call speciesism, which is a term invented to make the analogy that Bentham already made between racism, and we could add in sexism as well, and speciesism. So all three of these cases are cases where one group, which is the dominant, more powerful group, gives itself a special place in the moral universe and says, we're the ones that really matter. We're the ones that really can. And the others 
Well, maybe they can't to some extent, but they don't can't in the same way that we can't. So we're very familiar with that with racism, as I've said. The, the most extreme version of that was the racism that was used to justify slavery, but we still have other forms of racism. With sexism, we're also familiar with the idea that... Um, it's not working? Okay, um, so with sexism, we've had somewhat similar ideas. Again, the ideas uh, that males are more important, that they should rule, that they, for a long time, were the only ones who could vote, and before that, the only ones who could be elected to parliament, and so on. Uh, we're familiar with a whole lot of laws that disadvantage women, um, and now we're starting to emerge from that. Um, but as far as speciesism is concerned, we are still very much in the midst of a speciesist era, uh, one in which our practices are very much in accordance with the ideology that humans, if you're a member of the species Homo sapien, you're more important than if you're some other kind of being. All right, I did say that I would look at the question of which animals are, have interests, are capable of feeling pain. And first we should ask, well, how do we know that any animals can feel pain? So here very briefly is the kinds of evidence that we have. We can look at the nervous systems of animals. We can look at how they're organized. We can look at what happens in their brains when they suffer injury, for instance. And we see that similar things happen in animals, certainly the animals that are more closely related to us, the birds and mammals and other vertebrates to some extent, we can see that similar things happen with them as happens with us. So that's perhaps the most important kind of evidence, but we also see similar behavior. As Darwin noticed, we see evident signs of pleasure and joy in puppies and kittens playing just as we do in our own children. And when we inflict pain on an animal, we see behavior that also very often resembles the pain behavior of ourselves that we recognize as that's how we behave when we get injured, when we're in pain. And thirdly, we have a common evolutionary history. So given that we have similar nervous systems, anatomy, similar behavior, it's very plausible to believe that this is because these nervous, nervous systems, systems function in the same way, that they have, have a common have. origin, that already before we divided from the other animals, this capacity for pain, for consciousness, had already evolved. So those are the grounds why I think we should accept that animals have interests. But you might say, well, this is still very broad, we have to say something about which animals. Because particularly if we talk about common evolutionary origins, obviously the evolutionary separation between us and chimpanzees happened much more recently than the evolutionary separation between us and fish, for instance. So we do have to acknowledge that. And so when we ask whether animals feel pain, I think we have to acknowledge that the degree of confidence we can have will vary depending on the similarities of the nervous system and the brain, the similarities of behavior, and the evolutionary distance that we have. So uh, I think it's reasonable to believe that um, all vertebrates can feel pain. I think the evidence is strongest for birds and mammals, but I think it's reasonable to believe that all vertebrates can feel pain. There has been some research on fish, which does seem to suggest that they feel pain in similar ways to the way that we do. Um, when you get to invertebrates, it becomes a little more difficult. Their nervous systems are less like ours. Their evolutionary origin is... Uh, evolutionary separation is a lot earlier. So I would start to say at this point, well, I would give them the balance of the doubt where I could. 
If I don't need to inflict pain on a lobster, then better not to do so. But if, for example, you're starving and you have a choice between um, eating a lobster or starving, then certainly I think you should eat the lobster. Maybe in those circumstances you should eat the birds or mammals as well. But, but if you have a choice between an animal that, where you could be more confident that there's pain, uh, then you should rather choose the, uh, the species where you'd be less confident. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think, I think there's good evidence that uh, some invertebrates can feel pain, and that's why I've mentioned the octopus here. Um, because the behavior of the octopus is very difficult to explain without assuming that an octopus is capable of thought, of actually solving novel problems. Um, if you're skeptical about that, I suggest you go to YouTube and uh, Google some videos about octopus and sooner or later you'll come along uh, to a video which shows an octopus uh, this is a kind of octopus that eats small crabs. And the octopus has been given a crab to eat, but the crab is in a glass jar with a screw-top lid. Now, the octopus has never seen a glass jar with a screw-top lid. Obviously, it did not evolve to get food out of glass jars with screw-top lids. But the octopus doesn't take very long to work out that it can open the lid with its tentacles and get at the crab that's in there. And I think that has to involve some kind of thought. But anyway, um, I think it's all a, a matter of, you know, of going from great confidence to low confidence. Um, and with clams and oysters and so on, I think the confidence you could have that they can feel pain is very low because their nervous systems are very rudimentary. Um, so perhaps there you could say there isn't too much risk that they can feel pain, um, but uh, in any case, you know, avoid inflicting pain where you can, where you can't be certain seems like a useful rule. The last question that I'm leaving with here is, in saying that they can feel pain, it's, it's still hard to say exactly what that consciousness is like and to what extent it compares with our own. But I don't think we should think that it's necessarily going to be less than our own because we're not talking about a human being. So um, animals have some senses which are very acute, obviously. Everybody who's had anything to do with a dog will know that a dog has a more acute sense of smell than we do. Less acute sense of sight, but a more acute sense of smell. So um, there are no doubt some animals which may have more acute senses of pain because that may have been necessary for them to survive in their environment um, than we do. There's no particular reason to think that that could not be so. What you can say is that the kinds of distress that involve reflection and thought about more complex, more abstract ideas, they probably are things that are more limited to human beings and indeed not even present in all human beings as Bentham pointed out, certainly not present in, present in babies but something that humans, more mature humans would have. So here's an example of this. Um, here are some cattle, uh, cows and their young which are being kept on an organic farm. Um, this photograph was taken quite near Princeton University in New Jersey. Um, an organic farm that provides the animals with plenty of grass, as you see. Uh, the young are kept with their mothers um, for some months after they're born. Um, they're protected from the elements if the weather gets bad. So basically they have what they need. They, they have, their interests are met, at least while they're alive. Of course, eventually the, the calves will be taken to be slaughtered. But while they're alive, their interests are, are met. Um, the interests of humans would not be met like that. Um, the interests of humans, you can give them enough food, you could keep them in a small social group, you could protect them from predators, but uh, we think at least that they have other interests, that they have, for example, an interest in learning about the world, getting an education, which cars do not have. So 
I'm not saying that the interests of cows are the same as the interests of humans. I am saying where we're talking about similar interests, then we should give them similar weight. And the most important area, I think, the most significant area where this question of dissimilar interests is relevant to our treatment of animals is in the question of whether it is wrong to painlessly kill non-human animals in the way that it is wrong to painlessly kill human beings. Um, and I'll come to that in, in just a moment. Um, let me just say something about progress that's been made. I'll be talking towards the end of the talk about progress for animals. But I think the argument that I've put forward has made progress in being more widely accepted than it was back in the 1970s. This is a review of the second edition of my book, Animal Liberation, which came out in uh, 1990. And it's by Colin McGinn, quite a notable philosopher. And what he's saying is that the argument that I put forward in the first edition, which was published in 1975, has actually been won, uh, as far as he, he's concerned anyway, um, in principle, if not in practice. So it hasn't been implemented. And then, but then the, the real reason I'm putting up this quote is not to say that Colin McGinn agrees with me, which is nice, but to say this remark. So he's saying that 20 years ago, if he had said that this argument about how we treat animals, that the way we treat animals is deeply and systematically immoral, he would have been accused of shocking moral arrogance or mild insanity. So in that space of 20 years, the argument certainly got more widely accepted that there was something deeply and systematically wrong with the way we're treating animals. And that's an important aspect of the progress we need to make. Now, let me come to that question about killing that I mentioned a moment ago. I'm, I'm going to talk about three questions that I think are open questions. So for those of you who are philosophers, or studying philosophy, interested in doing philosophical work in this area, these seem to me to be questions that are worth working on, where there's plenty of scope for argument and further discussion. So the first one is, as I said, this question, is painlessly killing animals wrong? Now you might say, well, if animals can live happy lives, isn't it better that they live happy lives than that they be killed? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. But in the case of these animals, who are living happy lives at the time this photo is taken, I believe, if the farmer were not allowed to kill them, they would not exist at all. Because the farmer has to be paid for his work, has to be paid for the labor and the food that he provides when there isn't fresh grass uh, for them to eat. So. The calves here will be killed in a few months, but they will be replaced by other calves that will also ha have happy lives. And the arguments therefore put forward that if what we're interested in is animals having happy lives and not suffering, then painlessly killing them does not prevent that. In fact, painlessly killing them, it could be argued, permits more animals to be alive and to have good lives insofar as you know, they are animals that have happy lives, like these ones. So this is a complicated question. Should we think of animals as replaceable in this way? And I refer here to the uh, book published by Derek Powerford in 1984, Reasons and Persons, the last part of that, part four, of which discusses this in a lot of depth. But a number of other writers don't accept this view, don't accept that animals are replaceable, and therefore reject this idea. Um, here's another quote from somebody who's arguing that even within the idea that similar interests ought to get similar weight, this doesn't show that it's wrong to kill animals painlessly. Roger Scruton is a uh, British philosopher, and the difference that he's pointing out to is the idea of a timely and an untimely death. Um, so with humans, if somebody is killed, let's say somebody who is killed while they're a student in their 20s, 20, at the age of 20 or something like that, 
we think what a tragedy that is because this person could have gone on to achieve other things, to do many good things. This person's life was cut short before those achievements could be made and we think of that as a tragedy. So Scruton's claim is that in the case of cattle, it's not a tragedy if they're killed at 30 months rather than 40, 50 or 60 months because their life would not have been significantly different. They would not have achieved more in their lives than they already did. And so if they're killed, it's different from killing a normal human being because of this idea that there was more for him or her to do in the case of the human, which does not apply to cattle. So there does seem to be some truth in that point. Let me just mention, though, that this is not a reason for thinking that all human lives have some sort of special value that no animal lives have. So it is still not a reason for the traditional doctrine of the sanctity of human life, which puts all human lives above all non-human lives. Because, again, as Bentham pointed out, some humans do not have capacities to reason or talk higher than those of non-human animals. And although babies, normal babies, will develop those capacities, some humans, because of perhaps a, a genetic abnormality or a brain injury that occurred during birth, will never have that capacity. So one could say what Roger Scruton here says about cattle about those humans. And if you think this is a reason for saying it's therefore not wrong to painlessly kill these animals, then perhaps you need to say the same about those humans, or if not, you need to find a justification for drawing the distinction between them. I won't go further into that, but I'm happy to discuss it in questions if you like. Okay, the second open question is what the experience of animals are like. And this is something that is really difficult, I think. If we think that we ought to give equal weight to similar interests, then we need to form some ideas about how much pain and how much pleasure different animals can experience. So how do we weigh these? Do we think that all of these species that I've put up here have similar capacities to feel pain or not? And if not, why not? And which, on what, what kinds of evidence should we use to say that some of them feel more pain than others? Does having greater cognitive abilities mean that you can suffer more? As I said, it means that you can suffer in some ways. So, for instance, if somebody is told that they have a terminal disease, that in, they will only live another six months, they may suffer, let's assume it's again a fairly young person, they may suffer greatly through the sense that they're unable to complete their life and make their achievements. An animal is not going to have that foreknowledge of when it is going to die. So it's not going to suffer in that way. But it may suffer more acutely in other ways, in other situations, where it cannot understand that perhaps it's been trapped and perhaps it's going to be released from that trap, but it can't understand that. So it feels desperate in that situation, desperately anxious that it's been trapped. Whereas with a human, maybe we could explain to somebody that, um, you know, can happen, for instance, if you want to go through the immigration authorities in the United States, they may say, um, There's, we've got a problem with your identification. You need to wait here. You can't go through yet. But, you know, you, there is, in fact, nothing wrong with your problems. You, you can relax. You probably know that there's, there's something that they have to check, and in an hour or two, you'll be on your way. So some things, some situations, our cognitive abilities reduce our suffering, and in other situations, they may increase it. So how we weigh these up is, I think, still an unanswered question for the animal movement. And the third set of open questions that I want to mention are ones that relate to animals living in a natural environment. And I've distinguished two different questions here. 
One is about the suffering of wild animals. So we know that predators cause wild animals to suffer. Some predators kill fairly quickly, but again, you only have to go on YouTube and look for videos of predators killing prey, and you can find some pretty, pretty grueling kinds of footage, really, of um, lions uh, attacking zebra, for example, and certainly those zebras are still conscious, basically, while some of their internal organs are being eaten at. It's not very pretty. Um, so, should we do anything about this? Should we try and stop lions from killing zebra? Of course, if we do, lions either won't exist or we'll have to bring them into captivity, kill animals humanely for them, as we do in zoos, and then feed them on those um, animals. And a lot of people think, we get into the second question here, a lot of people think that that would be a bad thing to do because there is intrinsic value in not only in the existence of lions, but also in their existence in nature, in their behaving in a natural way. And uh, in that kind of behavior, not disappearing because there are no more lions killing zebra in the wild. So I think those are questions that are just starting to be discussed in the animal movement. Um, they're philosophical questions, they're probably not very practical ones at the moment because uh, I don't think any people in the movement really are very serious about wanting to stop predation now. But that's perhaps because of the priorities of the movement, which for very good reasons are different. And I'll come on to those priorities in just a moment. Um, but it is still, I think, a challenging philosophical question about whether if we solved other problems relating to the way we treat animals, we should deal with this problem as well. Okay, so those are the open questions. Let me say a little bit, still in looking at the present, about practice, not about the philosophical theory, but about the practice of how we treat animals and at some of the progress that we've been making. So I'm focusing particularly on animals used for food. And the reason I'm doing this is because of the numbers involved. Okay, so if you look at the number of animals killed in research, which is one of the other areas that people in the animal liberation movement typically talk about, roughly maybe 100 million animals are used in research each year worldwide. We don't really know for sure. There is no good data on that. But that's a rough estimate. Probably wouldn't be too far out. Maybe it's 200, but it's somewhere in that area. Now look at the estimates that the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization makes for the number of land animals alone, we're not talking about fish here, used in food production. It's 60 billion. So we're talking about something like 600 times as many animals used in, research, used in food production as in research. And that's why this is, I think, by far the most important area of how we treat animals in terms of the amount of suffering. Those of you here with yesterday's lecture will know that I'm interested in trying to maximize the amount of good we can do, whether that concerns helping the global poor or reducing animal suffering. So why would you focus on a area in which only a few animals are involved rather than an area in which a very large number of animals are involved, at least if you have the same probability of changing the area in which more animals are involved. And in fact, I think the probabilities are just as good for food animals. In fact, in some ways I think they're higher because Whereas with the use of animals for research, <coughs> scientists can argue, and they certainly do argue, that without research, we will not be able to cure major diseases like HIV AIDS or cancer or diabetes, uh, that we need to use animals in research if we're to cure these diseases. Now, that may or may not be true, but when scientists say it, they have a lot of authority that the animal movement finds very difficult to match. On the other hand, in the case of the use of animals for food, 
Nobody can argue that this is a life or death matter, at least not for people living in developed countries who have a wide range of food choices. Nobody can argue that because it's obvious that there are millions of vegetarians and even now I think you could probably say millions or at least certainly hundreds of thousands of vegans even, people who eat no animal products at all in the world who live long and healthy lives. Perhaps they live, there's some evidence to suggest they live healthier lives than people who eat meat. So this is not a life-saving necessity in the way that it can be argued the use of uh, animals in research is a life-saving necessity. Okay, so we have fortunately made progress in the area of the treatment of animals for food, particularly if we focus on the European Union. I think you can be proud as members of a nation that is part of the European Union that more progress for farm animals has been made through the European Union than anywhere else in the world. And that's the result of initiatives that mostly were started something like 15 to 20 years ago um, and only actually fully came to fruition within the last three or four years. Because although regulations were passed more than 10 years ago, they had to be phased in very slowly to give the intensive farming industry the chance to adjust. So here's some of the things that I'm talking about. This is a breeding sow, a sow who is kept in order to produce piglets who will be used for ham or bacon or pork. And this is how breeding sows were kept in Europe until uh, about 18 months ago. It was legal to keep sows confined for virtually their entire lives in this kind of stall, too narrow for them even to turn around. And unfortunately, this is still legal in the United States um, and legal in Australia and many other countries. Um, although there are some moves to phase it out in at least some states in the United States now. This is another example of the same type of thing. Again, stalls too narrow for the animals to turn around. Um, the only real difference is there's a slatted metal floor rather than a concrete floor. Neither of these is at all comfortable for the animals, um, but they save labour as compared with putting straw on the floor, for instance. Um, so it saves money, so that's what's done. And um, uh, unfortunately, that's still the case. Even though you, it's illegal to keep pigs in such narrow confinement, um, you still don't have to give them bedding. So as I said, um, the notice of the ban came into effect in 2001. The ban came into effect in 2013. Um, and there are some states that have now said that this is going to be phased out. The most important one is coming quite soon next January in California, unless various lawsuits that are currently going through the courts in the United States succeed in blocking it. And that is a real danger, but we will find out whether the courts uphold them or not. Here's something else that was standard in the European Union until quite recently, the battery cage system for hens. Um, Extremely crowded, as you can see, very little space for the birds. Um, completely bare wire cages, uh, no nesting area or anything like that for the birds to lay their eggs in, although it's been shown that it is innate in hens to wish to lay their eggs in a sheltered, protected area. They will try to get to such an area if they have the opportunity to do so. So. This is how hens were kept, and again, how hens still are kept in um, many other countries. You can see here how crowded they are, and also you can see how this hen's feathers have been rubbed off, probably by being crushed against the wire by other hens, possibly by being pecked by other hens as well because of the crowding. The hens do tend to attack each other. Um, so that also was banned by the EU 
in 2012, which is not to say that hens can't be kept in wire cages. Unfortunately, they still can, but the cages have to be considerably larger. Um, they have to have a scratching area for the birds to wear down their claws, and they have to have this kind of separate little sheltered nesting area. Um, this is a, a chicken producing factory farm, and unfortunately this is not illegal in the EU or anywhere else. Chickens have become very cheap, as you know, and they become very cheap because of the mass scale of their production and the very little labour that is used to look after them. So this is a vast shed with about 20,000 chickens in it. Um, they are automatically fed through these pipes and feeders. So one of them will be bringing water, one will be bringing food into the shed. And uh, the birds are, as you can see, extremely crowded. They're also in vast numbers, which means that they can't identify other birds. Um, normally in a, in a flock of up to 90 hens, they get to know other individuals and uh, they understand which birds will be dominant over them and which birds they're dominant over and so a pecking order forms um, and essentially they don't get attacked. But in such a large group of birds they can't possibly know other individuals and they are likely to be much more stressed and much more under attack. So um, this is still the situation, less space than a standard sheet of paper um, that you have. Very high levels of ammonia in the air. If you walk into one of these sheds, you really, you know, when you breathe in, you feel distress in your throat and lungs because there's so much ammonia in the air. And uh, when the ammonia hits your saliva, um, it forms a weak kind of acid. And that's what you're feeling. Well, the birds have to breathe that all the time. The birds are bred to grow so fast that their legs sometimes collapse under them. Essentially, these chickens, which get quite large, that people buy in the supermarket, are really babies. They're seven weeks, six weeks old, sorry, 42 days is the standard uh, age at which chickens are killed. Um, but so at 42 days of age, their legs are still quite weak. Their bones are not fully hardened. And so their bones may collapse under them. And if, um, if their bones collapse under them, and let's say it's this bird here, um, it's not going to be able to get any food or water. It's too far away. Um, so it's just going to sit on the floor there, unable to move. Nobody is going to come to help it. Nobody is going to individually inspect all these chickens. Just doesn't pay. They're too cheap. Not worth the cost of paying the labour. So that bird is going to die of thirst um, right there in the middle of the other chickens. Eventually somebody will come through the shed and notice that there's a corpse on the ground and they'll pick up the corpse because that'll start to smell and decay and get maggots. Um, but, um, but, you know, in terms of actually caring for a sick or injured bird, you know, any, any mass factory farm chicken producer would laugh at that idea. Um, it just simply doesn't pay. And the other problem with um, these birds is the reason, you know, as I say, they're bred to grow so fast that their legs may collapse. Um, and they're bred to eat a lot in order to grow fast. Now, these birds, of course, have parents. The, the birds that you're eating, if you eat chicken, at 42 days of age, are immature. They're not sexually mature. So you can't breed from birds at 42 days of age. You have to have older birds, which will be the parents of the other birds that you saw in the shed. But because they have to be the same breed and they have to grow, also, they will also grow very fast and they will also have a huge appetite. And if you let them eat as much as they want, they will get enormously obese, right? At 42 days, they're the size you see in the supermarket. But imagine at six months or nine months, when they're sexually mature, they will be very obese. And they might well just get heart attacks and die. Or, in fact, the males may be so obese that they're not really capable of mating with the females. So, how do you stop them getting so obese? Simple. You don't feed them as much as they would like to eat. So, they're bred to have a big appetite, to grow fast, and then the breeding birds are kept permanently hungry. Otherwise, 
there would be no more chickens. Okay, um, just briefly to say something about fish. Um, I said before that there's 60 billion animals, land animals, uh, land vertebrates, I should say, used for food. The numbers for fish are even bigger. According to this website, fishcount.org, um, it's at least one trillion animals. Some fish, of course, are very small. So the numbers are huge. This doesn't include the, the bycatch, which are thrown away, depending on the species that you're fishing for. Maybe about a third as many fish are caught and thrown away, usually dead if they've been hauled up from the deep ocean. And as I say, there's strong evidence that fish do feel pain. Here's a book by Victoria Braithwaite called Do Fish Feel Pain? It's worth looking at if you question that. And there isn't really any humane slaughter for fish. So the ways in which they die in commercial wild caught fisheries in particular, but also fish farms, are generally, generally involve pain and suffering. So even if they don't suffer for their whole lives, like the factory farmed animals, because they're swimming in the ocean most of their lives, the numbers are so big that the amount of suffering is very significant. Okay, um, just to finish off, some brief remarks on where we may be going in the future and some reasons why we might be cautiously optimistic about making progress in this area. Uh, here are two books, one of which is one of my books, uh, The Expanding Circle, Ethics, Evolution and Moral Progress. Um, and here's a book by the Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker. And in a way, they are both putting forward similar ideas, that is, that there has been moral progress over the centuries, and that in some way it may be linked up with our capacities to reason. So, I recommend you look at these books. Um, if you want a short book, you should read mine. If you want a book that makes the strongest case for the thesis, you should read Steven Pinker's. He does make a stronger case than I do, partly because his book is much longer, partly because as a psychologist, he documents it with a lot of empirical evidence about the moral progress that we are making and the role that he thinks reason is playing in this. So um, I found it, a, found it a very impressive book and I was glad that he was arguing for a similar sort of view to the one I was arguing for. Now, here are some graphs that come from his book. Um, here's an example of moral progress. The numbers are laughably small. I said before I think numbers matter. So I don't think that this is an important issue at all because the numbers are tiny. But it's a sign of, if you like, how public opinion has changed in the United States since 1970 and how that affects the movie industry. So these are the number of pictures made each year, the number of films in which animals were harmed. And as you see, if you go back to the early 1970s, it was somewhere between 10 and 15. Then it started dropping by 1980 to somewhere below 5. And since 1990, it's dropped again, and it's, you know, one or zero in most years. So I think that shows that in an area like that, in the area of entertainment, people don't really tolerate causing harm to animals for entertainment in the movie industry. Here's another um, interesting example about the United States. Um, Hunting is in decline, even though there are still animals to be hunted. Um, the number of, anim of American households with hunters is falling, and this seems to be a generational shift, that the younger generation is less interested in hunting. Not that there aren't still interests, but they're less interested in hunting than, again, going back to the 1970s. And perhaps the most significant of these charts is the increase in vegetarianism in... This chart shows two countries, the United Kingdom and the United States. The United Kingdom is at the higher level. It's uh, represented by these dots, and the line just draws a line through them, showing the trend, um, rising from about 2.5% in the mid-1980s to somewhere over 5% um, 
by 2010. In the United States, actually, you can't see this line very well. It hasn't shown up very clearly on the slide. It starts from a lower base in 1995, um, somewhere around 1%, and but has gradually been increasing. If you can see, I'm trying to trace the line, little dip there, going up again here. Um, the questions asked were slightly different, but the um, United States question might have been a little bit clearer because it clearly excluded fish, whereas in the UK, some people think that vegetarian might include fish. Um, but uh, anyway, the, the trends in both cases are up. And the interesting thing is that in the United States, this is also reflected in figures from the meat industry itself, which show that meat consumption appears to have peaked in the United States just a few years ago and is now falling. Um, so, you know, you could go back more or less the entire history of the United States and you would see rising in per capita meat consumption. Um, particularly beef, which is the dark line here, um, rose strongly to this highest level ever, um, about 90 pounds of beef per capita in the mid-1970s. Um, then it started to fall, and the fall has continued quite steadily to the present. Now, that didn't mean that meat consumption started falling in 1976, because look at this line. This is broilers, in other words, chicken. This line went steadily up as beef consumption came down. You could say beef was replaced by chicken, probably just because people thought it was healthier. They were worried about their saturated fat, their cholesterol, and they replaced beef by chicken. Whoops, sorry. But now, chicken consumption has peaked as well, it seems. For the last, I've actually got figures for 2013 as well, and they show, looks like a clear decline now for chicken consumption as well. So it's interesting that Americans are eating less meat. This may be because there's more vegetarians uh, in the United States, or it may be because there are more people who are cutting out meat from some meals. There's been a movement, what's called Meatless Mondays, to have one day a week where you don't eat meat. And this has been quite widely accepted, even in some official areas. So, for example, in the entire Los Angeles school district, the school canteens serve a meatless main course on Mondays. So school children, they can bring food from home, of course, but generally they will have, uh, not have meat on Mondays. And a lot of company co uh, corporation canteens do something similar. So it may be that that's having an effect as well. Anyway, Americans seem to be eating less meat. So this is good news, obviously, uh, given the suffering of animals in factory farms. The bad news comes in the next slide, and that is that as some developing countries or formerly developing countries get more affluent, their people can afford more meat. And the biggest example of this is China. So as China got more affluent through the 1990s and onwards, meat consumption skyrocketed. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is starting to... Um, uh, catch up. It's still not at American levels, but it's still starting to catch up. And this is all provided by intensive farming, or pretty much all provided by intensive farming. So this is a disastrous scenario, admittedly. We have to hope that it is also going to peak, hopefully earlier than meat consumption peaked in the US. Um, because otherwise, we're not only are animals going to suffer immensely, but we are going to be in a lot of trouble with regard to climate change. And here's the reason for that. A report from, the again, the United Nations Food and Agriculture uh, Organization saying that the livestock sector generates more greenhouse gas emissions as measured in carbon dioxide equivalents, 18% than transport. So producing animal products for food produces more greenhouse gas emissions than all of the cars, all of the trucks, all of the buses, all of the trains, all of the ships, all of the aeroplanes. Um, it's a very big contributing factor, the second biggest, in fact, after uh, electric power generation. It's the second biggest. So if China 
increases and continues to increase its livestock production, it is going to accelerate climate change, make it much more difficult to slow down climate change. And that will be a disaster for China as well as for the rest of the world. So we have to hope that the Chinese government will recognize this, and if not because of concern for animal welfare, although that, there are signs that that is also increasing in China, if not for that, we'll at least um, do it for the sake of climate change. Okay, so just fine. The other, re the other reason for hope why we may reduce the number of animals being raised for food is that we are getting better at developing alternatives. This is one possible alternative, um, using uh, um, in vitro production at the cellular level of, a, of what is in fact meat at the level of the individual cell and using that initially at least to replace uh, hamburger meat and um, perhaps eventually to replace steak as well. That would be a possibility and this is, you can look at this website, New Harvest, uh, and you can find a lot of discussion of progress in that. And uh, my final slide is about a new American company started by some people who were concerned about animal suffering and concerned about the environment. And they decided to produce an alternative, a plant-based alternative for the eggs that go into cakes and things like that. So they are not making whole eggs in shells. That at least at the moment is too difficult. But about 30% of the eggs produced are used as egg mixes in baking, in cakes and other products where essentially, at least at the commercial level, this is just powdered egg. The eggs are, are turned into powder. <coughs> and they think that that's relatively easy to replace. Replace with a product that has the same effect in terms of cooking, binding the products together, is nutritionally just as good or better um, because it has protein and is economical and is environmentally sustainable. And uh, this startup, um, which was you know, only a few years old, has already been discussed in business magazines like Forbes um, and is entering, has already got a product that it's entering into negotiations with manufacturers to replace it. So I'm hopeful that uh, clever ideas like this will make a difference to the abuse of animals and will eventually contribute to phasing it out. Thanks very much for your attention. I'm very happy to have any comments or discuss any questions that you might have.